Hi, and welcome to my presentation on viruses and their replication. So viruses are the last type of microbe that we haven't really talked about at all yet um, in any detail. We've mentioned them briefly. Viruses are unique because they don't have cells. Um, every other microbe is at least a single-celled organism. Viruses are considered acellular because they don't have cells. Instead, they just have a protein coating called the capsid that surrounds their genome, um, which would either be DNA or RNA. And that's basically all the virus is, is that little protein coat with genome inside of it. Um, sometimes they'll have some enzymes in there as well, uh, but everything will just be inert, uh, basically dormant, not doing anything, just waiting um, to encounter a host. Um, so you have a couple of terms related to viruses. First, a virion is the word for one viral particle uh, when it's outside of the host only. So when a virus um, or when a virion attaches to the host and then enters the host, you don't call it a virion anymore after that because it's going to change kind of its format. Um, it should lose its capsid, the protein coat around the outside of it, and then you would just have uh, the genome inside and whatever enzymes um, that may have been in there being released into the host cell. So at that point, it wouldn't be like the virus is like a particle anymore, right? You would just have like a freely floating, floating genome, just a genome floating in, in the, inside the host cell and maybe some enzymes as well floating in the host cell. So it wouldn't be contained in anything. Um, and that's why we don't call it a virion anymore once it's inside its host cell. So a virus that is outside of a host cell would be in the form of, of a virion or single viral particles. Um, then we kind of classify viruses based on what type of host they infect. Uh, so we might talk about animal viruses that, of course, you know, infect animal cells or plant viruses. But for viruses that infect bacteria, they have a special name, uh, which is the bacteriophage. So a bacteriophage is any virus that infects bacteria. And you hear about them a lot um, in biology courses, mostly because they're useful in the lab. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to study viruses if you're studying bac bac bleh, bacteriophages um, since you just need a bacteria to be your host cells instead of having to have animal cells to be the host. And um, also they're just, there's, they're useful. There's a lot of lab tools actually that are derived from viruses and commonly from bacteriophages. Uh, so in addition to not having cells being a cellular, viruses also don't have organelles inside of them, of course. They don't have a cytoplasm, right? It's just the genome in there and maybe some enzymes. Um, they really don't have anything going on <laughs> inside of them when they're outside of the host cell. They're just floating. Um, they are obligate parasites, which means they have no choice but to parasitize a host um, if they're going to replicate. Um, they're not really quite like uh, bacteria we've talked about that are obligate parasites because those bacteria are typically, you know, they're considered alive. <laughs> um, they do have activity outside of the host cell. So if you have one of those bacteria that's outside of a host, it's definitely going to be in trouble. It's not really going to be able to survive well out there or replicate outside of the host, but it's still alive. It still has kind of metabolic processes going on inside of it. And uh, a lot of those bacteria will have kind of like um, spore type uh, like forms they go into that will help them transmit between hosts. Whereas for a virus, when it's outside of its host, it just is like an inert particle. It does nothing. It is not alive. There's nothing going on inside of it. Everything is just still. Um, so for that reason, they're not considered to be alive at all. Um, they only have any activity when they're inside a host cell. So they don't have their own metabolism. When they get, when they get inside the host cell, they're going to need um, to use the host cell metabolism for anything that they require that has energy requirements. Like if they need to do something with ATP, they have to steal it from the host or any other metabolite, they have to steal it from the host because they're not able to produce any energy on their own. They don't do protein synthesis, so that means that they can't make the proteins that you would need to, like, kind of reproduce the virus. Um, 
All right, the capsid itself is made out of protein, uh, so a virus cannot make that protein. It has to have the host cell make it. So the host cell is going to be forced to produce the proteins for the virus. Um, once the viral genome gets inside of the host cell, uh, the host will begin um, you know, using the genome to make proteins, and sometimes it'll replicate the genome as well. Um, so all in all, it's the host cell that's really doing all of the processes that the virus needs in order to replicate. Uh, the virus is kind of driving those processes and forcing the host cell to do them, uh, but it's the host cell that's actually doing them. So the virus could not build viral proteins without a host cell. It could not replicate, it could not form new viral particles without a host cell. We don't say that viruses reproduce uh, exactly. They're considered to not have reproduction because they can't do it on their own. Um, they have to force a host cell to build proteins for them, and then those proteins will assemble uh, into new viral particles. And we call that replication um, because it's very different from how bacterial cells would you know, reproduce or how any type of cell would reproduce. Um, most scientists, you know, typically <laughs> viruses are considered to not be alive. Most scientists consider them not alive. Um, but there actually are a few exceptions, like there are some scientists who do think they're alive, and that's just because they have genetic material and they evolve. So since they have either DNA or RNA in their genome, um, they're going to have mutations, um, you, can, you know, they have heredity uh, where their traits are passed on to the viruses that are replicated from, you know, the initial host uh, or the original virus that, in, that infects the host cell. Um, and they actually impact the evolution of other organisms as well, or I should say of proper organisms um, by gene transfer, because they, uh, they're a major, I guess, mechanism for horizontal gene transfer to occur. Um, so they carry, some viruses will actually carry genes that are from some cellular host, um, and some cellular hosts will have genes that come from viruses. So since they're kind of evolving alongside the rest of life, some, some scientists do think like that's enough, you know, to be considered alive. Um, either way, uh, you know, whatever you think of them being, <laughs> the fact remains that they evolve, they have no metabolism, and they do not reproduce. Um, when a virus gets inside of a host cell, it's going to go into one of two types of cycles, which you could consider like a life cycle. It's not really a proper life cycle because the virus is not properly alive, uh, but you know, it's the replication cycle kind of. Um, so you either have the lytic cycle or the lysogenic cycle. Um, the lytic cycle could also be called the virulent cycle, and viruses that go through the lytic cycle can also be called virulent viruses. And then the lysogenic cycle um, is done by temperate viruses. So if you're a virus that's going to go through the lysogenic cycle, you would be called the temperate virus. Um, in general, any virus that gets inside a host cell is going to follow one of those two pathways. Um, if it's following the lytic pathway, that's generally going to result in destroying the host cell. Um, you know, just as soon as the virus gets inside, it starts replicating until the host cell uh, bursts, basically, and all the new viral particles are released. In the lysogenic cycle, um, that doesn't necessarily kill the host cell, or at least doesn't kill it for a long time, uh, or for some time. Once the virus gets inside of the host, uh, it's basically going to remain dormant and do nothing and just wait there. Uh, until eventually it is activated and then it enters the lytic cycle and will kind of replicate the virus and then new particles would be released. Um, so we'll actually go more go into more detail on the life cycles in a bit, but before that we'll go over some basic characteristics of viruses. Um, first, their morphology or just you know the kind of shapes and structures that they have. Um, so every virus is going to have a capsid surrounding its genome. The capsid is made out of proteins, um, and essentially to be a virus, all you need is that capsid and the genome. If you have, you know, some type of genome surrounded by a protein capsid, that's a virus. Some viruses are also going to have other components. Uh, some of them might have enzymes inside the capsid as well. Those enzymes are going to be dormant and inactive until they get inside the host cell. Um, and, you know, they might be needed for different things. Sometimes, like, certain viruses would need enzymes to replicate uh, their genome if their genome is in kind of a strange format. Um, and a lot of those 
I guess, extra enzymes they might have would be involved with uh, basically evading host defenses and making sure that the virus is able to take over the cell and kind of force the cell to make the viral proteins. Um, then sometimes you might also have a membrane around the outside of the capsid, which is called an envelope. So if you're a virus that does not have that membrane, then you're called a naked virus. It's just the capsid and whatever's inside of it. Um, if you do have that membrane, you're called an enveloped virus or an enveloped virus. And that membrane around the outside is your envelope. So in the images here on top, you have a naked virus. That's just the capsid made out of proteins and in green, the genome inside of that capsid. Uh, on the bottom, you have an enveloped virus that has also a membrane going around the outside of the capsid. No matter what type of virus you are, naked or enveloped, you're going to need to have proteins on the surface uh, that allow you to attach to a host cell. So in the bottom diagram, you can actually see um, those proteins. These little balls sticking out of the envelope membrane would be proteins, you know, surface proteins that are used, most of them probably, to attach to the host cell. Um, for this naked virus, those proteins would just be part of the capsid and kind of sticking out from the capsid. So they're not really shown in that diagram specifically, but they would be there. Every virus has to have those proteins for attaching to the host in order to attach to the host. If you were able to get rid of those proteins off the surface of the virus, then there's no way for the virus to like kind of grab onto its host cell when it finds it. And if it can't grab onto the host, then it can't get inside. So for any enveloped virus, if you can destroy that membrane around the outside of it, um, you're going to get rid of its surface proteins that it needs to attach to a host cell. If you can destroy the membrane, that envelope, you can basically inactivate the virus and make it harmless so that it cannot attach to a host cell. For a naked virus, it's not as easy to get rid of those surface proteins. You would need, um, you know, I guess it's just, it's a lot easier to get rid of a membrane than it is to get rid of protein specifically. Membranes are kind of fragile, actually. You can break them just with soap. Um, there's benefits to having that envelope. Uh, of course, there's disadvantages. Like I mentioned, it's pretty easy to disrupt the membrane around the outside of the enveloped virus. Um, and once that membrane is disrupted, then, you know, that's basically it for the virus. It can't infect a host anymore. Um, so that's the drawback of having an envelope. But there's also some benefits um, for when you're inside of the host. So the host cell, um, if you're, well, I guess this wouldn't really apply actually <laughs> to uh, bacterial viruses or bacteriophages, but for, uh, for viruses that are trying to have an animal as their host, the host is going to have an immune system. And that immune system is going to be combating the virus and the viral infection. So one of the things the virus needs to do inside the host is evade the immune system and get around those defenses. And the envelope will actually make it easier to do that um, because of where the envelope comes from. So when, this, when these enveloped viruses are kind of emerging from the host cell and when you have new viral particles released from the host cell, um, they actually pick their envelope up from the host cell membrane on their way out. So they would start out in the host cell, you know, just having been freshly assembled as a capsid with genome inside, and then they're going to be emerging from the host cell. And as they're doing that, um, they just take a little piece of the membrane where they're going to come out at off of the host cell and put it around themselves, and that makes their envelope. So because their envelope is coming from the host cell membrane, it has some host cell proteins on it. It's going to have some viral proteins as well that the virus puts in there, but it's also going to have the host cell proteins. And when the host immune system sees those host cell proteins, it thinks it's looking at a host, um, you know, at a host cell. <laughs> it, thinks, it's, it thinks it's looking at something that is supposed to be there and isn't dangerous. So the virus can kind of try to trick the immune system of its host into believing that the virus is actually part of the host that's supposed to be there by having the envelope that comes from host cells. So that would be the benefit of the envelope. Um, as it happens, most viruses that do have an envelope are animal viruses, so they infect animals as their host. That's because most other cells that are not animal cells will have a cell wall around them. Um, and it's not very easy to kind of get through the cell wall with your envelope 
Um, so it's, it's easier to get into a, a host cell with an envelope if the host cell doesn't have a cell wall, it just has a membrane. Right, so any other virus, any virus is going to be infecting a different type of host cell, like a bacterial cell or a plant cell. It needs to have some way of penetrating the cell wall, and an envelope is just not going to help you do that. Um, we have a few different types of shapes that the capsid of, of a virus can form. Most of them are either icosahedral or helical. Um, if it's icosahedral, then it's kind of, you know, like one of these ball-like things with a bunch of little triangles on it, um, a ball made out of polygons. Um, so that's the typical virus that we think about. Here would be the capsid on this bacteriophage. Um, also icosahedral. That's very normal. The, the amount of kind of sides that it has can change from virus to virus, but it would always have, you know, this basic type of shape. Then you have the helical virus up here, where the capsid is kind of composed of all these individual proteins that are actually attached to the genome in a spiral, and then the genome just kind of circles up inside of it. These sometimes can be really large viruses, actually, depending on how long this helix is. Um, so most viruses are one of those two types. And then you have the complex viruses, which is basically, you know, whatever else. So here's an example of a complex virus with just kind of a strange, almost a pear shape to its capsid. So <laughs> it's just, if it's just not fitting into one of those other categories, it's complex. Um, here's uh, the actu actually the HIV virus. This would be complex as well. This is the capsid inside of here. And you see it just really has kind of a strange shape. Um, and then it has an envelope outside of the capsid. Inside the capsid in red, you have the genome. In blue, you have a couple of enzymes that the HIV virus needs in order to infect a host cell successfully. Um, and then also embedded in this uh, envelope, you have these things sticking out, which would be the proteins that it's using to attach to host cells. And then the last thing I'll point out on this slide is the bacteriophage virus right here. A lot of bacteriophages have this kind of characteristic shape, which is what, it's actually the most complicated shape of any virus that's known. Um, up here you have the capsid, uh, and inside of that the genome, and then all of this is used to attach to the host cell, um, and then inject the genome inside of it. So these tail fibers would grab onto the host cell, and then this um, basically syringe apparatus, um, the base plate and the sheath would, would attach the host cell and the contents of this capsid would then be injected through the sheath into the host cell under pressure. So the capsid there is icosahedral, but I guess you'd consider the whole virus to have a complex morphology. Apart from the capsid, the other major part of a virus is just the genome. Um, and viruses have genomes that are very different from the genomes of um, life forms, like proper life forms that have cells. So all um, cells have a genome that is double-stranded DNA um, in its format. So um, all of the information, all of the genetic information or hereditary information that they're storing is stored in these two strands of DNA that then would be wound around each other to form the double helix. Um, for viruses, their genome doesn't have to be in that format. Some of them will have a double-stranded DNA format, but some of them will have a different format. So they could have single-stranded DNA, um, they could have an RNA genome, so they don't have DNA in them at all, um, and then it could also be single-stranded or double-stranded RNA. Um, if it's single-stranded RNA or single-stranded DNA, then it can also be uh, either plus sense or minus sense. And we'll talk about what sense means um, on the next slide, actually. Um, but it applies to just the single-stranded uh, genomes, either RNA or DNA. Um, then in terms of the actual shape of the genome, it, it could either be circular or linear. Um, so for cellular life forms, prokaryotes have a circular chromosome. Eukaryotes have linear chromosomes. For viruses, it could be either way. But actually, the genome of a virus is really small. Um, they'll only have a few genes in their genome. So it's actually not big enough to be called a chromosome at all. 
Um, so we, the viruses don't have like proper chromosomes or, you know, viruses don't have chromosomes. <laughs> they just have pieces of RNA or DNA that form their genome that could either be circular or linear. And then you could have just the one piece or um, it could be broken up into multiple pieces, which would be called a segmented genome. Uh, then in this diagram, it's just kind of summarizing that. Viruses are either going to have DNA or RNA in their genomes, could be single-stranded or double-stranded. So single-stranded DNA, that could be either plus sense or minus sense, or double-stranded DNA. For RNA, it could be single-stranded, plus sense or minus sense, or double-stranded RNA. Um, SS is the abbreviation for single-stranded, and DS is the abbreviation for double-stranded. Uh, double um, and then you have kind of the weird viruses, the retroviruses and um, the hepatinoviruses, uh, which would also be, hepatinoviruses are classified as DNA retroviruses. Um, so the retroviruses will have an RNA genome, the DNA retroviruses will have a DNA genome, but um, I guess what makes them unique is that both of them are going to do the process of reverse transcription, which actually um, we're not going to worry about um, right, right, right now. But um, I guess the, just the work, the way that they work with their uh, genomes to get that into protein um, is, is unique. And now to explain sense. Um, so sense is kind of a property of single strands of uh, DNA or RNA. Um, each, each single strand of DNA or RNA can either be plus sense or minus sense. Um, and that's also called sense or anti-sense. Um, so if a strand of DNA or RNA is plus sense, uh, also called just sense, that means that it's basically the, the sequence of bases is right um, for reading that in, into a protein. Um, if the sequence of bases would be the same for mRNA of that gene, which means that it's giving you the codons. It basically has each codon that you would need to build the protein. So basically, if you had an RNA strand that was plus sense, that is mRNA. If you had a DNA strand that is plus sense, um, that would correspond to the coding strand of a double-stranded DNA genome. Um, and you would need to just replace the Ts in that strand with Us in order to get, you know, mRNA format. Uh, but the information would be in there. So in this diagram, this is kind of showing um, RNA being transcribed from DNA. So here's double-stranded DNA, and here's your mRNA that this um, RNA polymerase is building in the process of transcription. Um, it's using this blue strand as the template strand and the red strand up here as the coding strand. Um, and the red strand would be sense or plus sense, and then the mRNA would also be sense or plus sense. So the, the sequence of bases in this mRNA is the same as, um, as in the coding strand, except that you have Ts instead of Us. So AUC, that's a codon for building a protein based on this mRNA. And ATC, if you replace that T with a U, you would have AUC, and that's also a codon. So in any plus sense strand, you basically have just this, the codons that you would need to, to make that into a protein. Minus sense, on the other hand, is the opposite. Um, it's a sequence of bases that is complementary to the mRNA, but not the same as the mRNA. And another word for minus sense is just antisense. So if you have a minus sense strand, you cannot use that to build a protein. The codons aren't going to be right. It does not have the right bases. Um, it doesn't, I guess the bases sequence is not the same as the mRNA, so therefore the codons are not going to be right, and you can't build the protein with it. Uh, but, but since it's complementary to the mRNA, what you could do is use it as a template strand to build the mRNA strand um, that you would need to actually get protein out of it. So in this diagram, um, the blue strand, the template strand, is minus sense or antisense. So instead of AUC, it has TAG. So you couldn't use that to build protein. That's not the right codon. But you could use it to build a strand that does have the right sequence of bases to build the protein, um, just as the template DNA strand is used to build mRNA. So if you're a virus with a single-stranded genome, um, either it can be plus sense or minus sense. If you have a plus sense RNA, um, a plus sense single-stranded RNA genome, 
basically that means that your genome is already just like mRNA. Um, so that makes everything very simple. If your genome is a minus sense single-stranded RNA genome, that's more complicated because now um, your genome doesn't have the right sequence of bases to actually build a protein off of it. It doesn't have the right codons. First, you would need to build a different strand of RNA to serve as the mRNA. Um, and then that different strand would be plus sense if you're basing it on a minus sense template. Um, the same thing for your DNA viruses. They can either be plus sense or minus sense if they're single stranded. Um, and you know, one, one way of being is more complicated than the other. For DNA, if it was plus sense single stranded, that would actually be more complicated um, because then you would basically have the coding strand and not the template strand, but you would need uh, <laughs> you would need a template strand in order to make an mRNA strand so you could get protein. Um, since if you're DNA, you need, you, like, you need no matter what to make something that's RNA because your host cell can only make RNA into protein. It can't make DNA into protein. So first you have to get RNA no matter what. If you already had a negative sense single-stranded DNA genome, um, that's basically a template strand of DNA right there that you can use to build mRNA, viral mRNA, that would use, be used by the host cell to make protein. If you have um, a positive, a plus sense um, single-stranded DNA genome, then you can't directly use that as a template strand. It doesn't have the right sequence of bases to be a template strand. It has the right sequence to be a coding strand, which means that first you need to use it to make a template, and then you can use it to make that, that template that you made to make mRNA. <laughs> so it gets pretty complicated depending on um, whether the genome is RNA, DNA, um, plus sense or minus sense, if it's going to be single-stranded. Um, before we move on to talking about the viral life cycles in more detail or you know what happens when a virus infects a cell, uh, we'll just briefly talk about how you can kind of count viruses in the lab. Um, and you don't do it directly because viruses are so small that you can't see them. Um, most of them don't show up even under a microscope. Um, you know, most of them would show up under an electron microscope, but not a, like a regular light microscope. <laughs> most labs don't have an electron microscope. Um, so you're going to count the viruses indirectly rather than, you know, just directly counting how many there are. Uh, one of the most common ways to do that is by using a plaque assay. Um, that's used for, it can be used for bacteriophages or for animal viruses. And I guess the exact procedure is a little different depending. If you were going to do the plaque assay to count uh, bacteriophages, then you would have, um, you know, you would have a culture of your bacteria that are going to serve as host cells for these viruses. And then you mix them with a sample of viruses in this liquefied agar solution. Um, then you would pour that into a Petri dish and let it cool and solidify um, until you would have basically, you know, you would be culturing those bacteria in this Petri dish. Um, but some of them will have viruses that they had been infected with since you mix the bacteria with the virus sample. Um, some of them will not have a virus infected them, some of them will. Um, as time passes, as you're incubating that Petri dish, everything is going to grow. The bacteria that didn't have a virus will, you know, be dividing as normal. Um, they'll replicate and fill up the Petri dish. And every place where you had um, a bacteria that got infected with the virus, that bacteria is not going to grow, or that bacterium will not grow. Instead, you're going to have um, it basically being destroyed and releasing a bunch of new viral particles that will go infect the bacteria around it. Um, and that is going to leave little circles behind, little empty circles on your plate that you can see where all these bacteria have just died uh, because of the virus that's infecting them. And we call each one of those little circles a plaque. Then you basically just count how many plaques you have or how many of those little circles of dead cells you've got. Um, and then you can use that with some math to calculate how many viruses must have been in your original sample. But um, similar to with cell counts, you wouldn't actually be counting viruses, you would be counting plaque forming units. So that's similar to um, counting col colony forming units instead of you know, actual bacterial cells for, for bacteria. Um, so a plaque forming unit is just the number of viruses that it takes to form one plaque or one circle of dead cells, which ideally would be one virus, but you know, it could also have been a little clump. Um, 
So this is a diagram kind of showing that process where here you have your a sample of bacteria, uh, host cells, and bacteriophage viruses um, in liquid agar. Then you pour that into a plate and let it solidify. Um, the bacteria are going to start growing and cover the whole plate, and then wherever you had viruses infecting the cells, that's going to leave a little circle of dead cells that you then count. And then this picture has actual, this is like an actual, um, you know, petri dish growing bacteria, uh, for a plaque assay, so you can see the little plaques. Um, when the bacteria are covering the petri dish thickly like this, we would call that a lawn. It's basically a solid lawn of bacteria where every surface is covered with the bacteria except for these plaques where the bacteria have died. If you were doing it with animal viruses, it would be a little different. Instead of um, mixing the host cells with the viruses, you would actually just plate the host cells first and let them grow to form like a solid layer at the bottom of the dish, and then you would pour the viruses on top of it. Um, that's just because of the differences in how you culture vi um, bacteria versus animal cells. Uh, but the result would be the same where you have the plaques and then you count them. Okay, so here's the first or most common um, viral life cycle, the lytic cycle. Um, you have five basic steps of the, little, of the lytic cycle. The first is attachment. In the attachment phase, the virus, or at this point it's called a virion, uh, your individual virion particles are going to attach to the host cell, um, and they have to use the proteins, the surface proteins they have on the outside um, of their outermost surface. So either the capsid for a naked virus or the envelope for an enveloped virus. Um, so those surface proteins are going to attach to some receptor on the host cell. That could be a protein um, on the cell, it could be uh, a carbohydrate, just something on the cell surface that the virus can grab onto. Each virus is going to have a specific receptor that it's able to bind. Um, some of those receptors, if they're a protein, they might be a transport protein, uh, they might be part of the flagellum, they might be part of um, a fimbrium, they may, might be part of a pilus, um, part of anything on the surface of the bacteria. If the bacteria has a glycocalyx, it could be a carbohydrate in the glycocalyx. If it's gram-negative, it could be LPS, that uh, polysaccharide in the membrane, in the outer membrane of the cell. Um, anything yeah, <laughs> it could be a lot of different things. Uh, different viruses will have specific different receptors that they're using. Um, so if you're a virus that's attaching to a specific transport protein as your receptor, you can only um, infect bacteria or cells that have that specific transport protein. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to infect maybe a different species of cell that doesn't have the same transport proteins, you're not going to be able to attach, and that means you can't get inside. Um, so each virus is going to be kind of limited in the host that it can infect by the fact that the host just needs to have a receptor for the specific attachment proteins that the virus has. Um, with, uh, with bird flu, or the avian flu that um, went across the world some years ago, um, that virus actually was attaching to a different receptor than the swine flu, and that is what made it less transmissible between people compared to birds. Um, so the swine flu is attaching to a receptor that's located in humans very high in the respiratory tract, so it's easy for the virus to attach, that makes it very transmissible. Um, with the avian flu, it was attaching to a different receptor that in humans is low in the respiratory tract, which means you would need to breathe the virus in very deeply into your body in order for it to find cells that have that receptor that it could infect. If it just stayed in the upper parts of your respiratory tract, like if it got caught on the mucus of your nose, then it's going to be stuck there, and none of the cells have the receptor that would let it inside, um, so it's not dangerous as long as it's there. That made it much harder for people to transmit the avian flu, um, you know, to other people. Um, and that's why it didn't spread quickly amongst people compared to the swine flu. Um, so once your, once your virus has attached to its host cell, the next step is penetration, in which the host cell is either going to take the virus up into it, take the virion inside of the host cell, or the virion will inject its contents into the host cell. Um, usually, if the host cell has a cell wall, it's more likely that the virus is going to inject its contents inside. 
it's going to um, just kind of tap through that cell wall um, and then inject its genome into the cell. Um, for animal viruses that have a membrane instead of a cell wall, it's more likely that the virus would actually be taken up into the cell um, by different mechanisms. There's a lot of different ways that the virus can be taken up, but um, that's easier to do if, if the cell has a membrane and not a cell wall. Um, and for a virus that does get taken up into the host cell, after it's taken up, it needs to get rid of its capsid coat. It needs to release its genome and any enzymes that it has into the cell. If those things stay inside of the capsid, then they can't interact with the host cell, and that means that the virus is just um, is basically not going to replicate, uh, and it's going to remain inactive um, and doing nothing inside the host cell. Uh, so that process of getting rid of the capsid is called uncoating. So some people will count the lytic cycle as having six steps for a virus that is taken up to the, into the host cell because they would be counting uncoating as like a third step after penetration. But we won't count it as a third step. <laughs> we'll just remark that it does occur. Um, once, the, once the virion has either been taken up and uncoated itself or has injected its contents into the host cell, now we don't call it a virion anymore because now the genome is separate from the capsid. So the capsid is not enclosing the components of the virus anymore. Um, it's just empty and then you have a genome floating somewhere and somewhere you might have some enzymes if the virus had some enzymes inside of it. In the diagram, um, you have some different uh, viruses attaching to um, a gram-negative bacterium, um, and it's just showing different receptors that could be used. So this, it would be the cell membrane of the bacterium, and then this would be the um, cell wall with the outer membrane. <clears throat> so that this coming up off of it would be LPS, and it would actually be like everywhere. So you have some viruses that can attach to the flagellum, like this virus right here. Um, these viruses are attaching to a pilus. This is also a virus attaching to the pilus. Um, they're attaching in different spots on the pilus, so that lets you know that they're using different receptors. This one is using a receptor that's at the very end of the pilus, and these ones are using receptors that are on the side of the pilus. Here's um, a typical, typically shaped bacteriophage that's attaching to a transport protein. This one's attaching to LPS, and then this one's also attaching to LPS. Basically anything on the surface could be used to attach by some type of virus. Um, this is an electron micrograph showing a bacteriophage like this attaching to its host cell and actually injecting its contents. Um, so you see kind of the, the periplasm right here um, and you can see it gets smaller in the next photos and that's because the virus is actually penetrating it and injecting stuff through it. Um, it's going to inject its genome into the host cell. And then here is a diagram of that happening where the bacteriophage will attach and it extends its sheath down through the outer membrane, penetrating um, the peptidoglycan of the cell wall as well into the periplasm. And then it can inject its genome straight through the cell wall into the periplasm and then um, through the membrane. After penetration, you have the synthesis step in which um, the genome of the virus is going to be replicating. So you're making a lot of copies of it and you're making viral proteins. Um, for making viral proteins, it's always going to be the host cell that does that. So you're going to have host cell ribosomes and host cell tRNA um, manufacturing these viral proteins. Then you have to provide mRNA for that ribosome to read. Um, so depending on the format of the virus's genome, it's going to have different ways to get some viral mRNA that the, that the uh, host ribosome can read to make a protein. Um, also, depending on the format of the genome of the virus, that is determining how or, or what process is going to be used to replicate the genome. For some viruses, it's going to be the host cell polymerases that are replicating the virus's genome and building mRNA um, for the ribosome. For other viruses, um, it would need to use its own special viral enzymes to replicate the genome and to make mRNA uh, for the ribosome. Um, in that case, the viral polymerases would also be using 
um, nucleotides that are from the cell, ATP from the cell, anything they need um, is going to be coming from the cell to, to make the new copies of the virus's genome and to make, you know, mRNA, viral mRNA for the, for the host cell ribosome to make viral protein. Um, a lot of the time in the synthesis step, the host cell is actually going to stop transcribing its own proteins or transcribing its own mRNA um, and stop translating its own proteins from that mRNA. Uh, so that depends on the virus, but a lot of viruses are going to have proteins in them uh, that once they get into the host cell are going to prevent the host cell from doing transcription and translation. Um, and then they'll have some kind of workaround so that this host cell can still replicate the virus genome and do translation on the viral mRNA to make viral proteins. So then the host cell will basically stop working um, for the host cell itself and start working for the virus instead. And the normal functions of the cell would shut down, and that kind of means that the host cell um, is having a hard time responding to the virus. It's like it's going to be hard for the host cell to kind of defend itself against the virus if it's not able to make any new proteins. Um, and it also means that the host cell is now kind of sickly and, <laughs> you know, a little bit like dying. Um, after you've made all these new copies of the virus's genome and all the viral proteins that are needed, then you have the next step, which is the assembly step or the assembly stage, um, in which you're basically having those genomes and proteins come together to make new viral particles. Um, so a lot of those viral proteins would have been for the capsid, like capsid proteins. They're going to assemble into capsids, and then you're going to um, pump the genome inside of the capsid and any enzymes that you need would be, you know, replicated or, you know, yeah, replicated or translated and then pumped inside of the capsid. Um, sometimes that might kind of happen by itself. Some of those proteins are kind of self-assembling, so they're just kind of, they'll just kind of snap together into a new capsid. Um, sometimes you have to have special enzymes, maybe from the virus, maybe from the host cell and ATP to fuel the process. And also sometimes during the assembly step, the virus kind of makes a mistake. And instead of pumping just viral DNA into the new capsids, um, it might include some of the host DNA as well, or some of the host genetic material. Um, and if that happens, the next host is also going to get that, uh, that, that genetic material or that DNA from the previous host. And that's an example of horizontal gene transfer. So viruses play a big role in horizontal gene transfer. Um, not only do they, not only are they able to transfer genes between prokaryotes, but also between eukaryotes. So anytime that you have um, horizontal gene transfer in a eukaryote, it's actually very, very, very probable <laughs> that it's because of a virus. Um, viruses would be the only like significant natural pathway for that to happen. Um, after the assembly phase, when you've got, you would have got like all these new viral particles complete and ready to go inside the host cell waiting to be released. Um, and usually it'll just be when they build up to be just too much to actually fit inside the host cell that they will break the host cell open and then you have the next phase, the release phase. Um, in the release phase, the viral particles start leaving the host cell. Um, and as soon as they're out of the host cell, uh, we call them virions again. Usually when that happens, the host cell will burst apart and lice and be destroyed. Um, sometimes the host cell would not lice, actually. If you had the virions being released kind of slowly over time or kind of gradually, then, um, then the host cell might not be destroyed, actually. That happens with animal viruses sometimes where they don't actually destroy the host cell at the end of the lytic cycle. Um, instead, you just have for a long time, uh, virus is being released from it um, kind of in slow in low amounts, kind of low and steady. <laughs> and we call that a persistent infection. Um, and then finally, during the release phase, if this is an enveloped virus that's coming out of the host cell on its way out, it's going to snatch a little piece of the cell membrane of the host cell membrane and use it for the envelope. So that that little patch that becomes its envelope is going to have not only viral proteins, but also host cell proteins on it. Host cells are going to 
have different ways of protecting themselves against viral infections, and ways to combat vir viral infections. Viruses will also have ways around those defenses. Um, so host cells and viruses are kind of locked into an arms race where host cells are always evolving new defenses and viruses are always evolving new ways to get around those defenses and defeat them. Um, you guys might have heard of CRISPR. Uh, it's become really, I guess, really famous recently. CRISPR is actually a viral defense system used by uh, bacteria and archaea. Um, the way it works is that when a virus infects a bacterium or an archaeal cell, um, if the cell survives that infection, it's going to have taken little pieces of the DNA um, from that virus and put it into the genome and put it into the host cell genome um, as a CRISPR region. Um, so it'll have basically parts of its genome where it has these little segments of DNA that have come from viruses that infected the cell in the past. Um, each one is a CRISPR, uh, CRISPR spacer. Um, and then when, if, or I should say if, <laughs> the virus, if the same virus infects that host cell again in the future, um, those little segments of DNA from the, from the same virus in the past is going to be used to uh, defeat the infection. Um, so this diagram is kind of showing the process where you start out with a virus that infects the host cell and little chunks of its DNA are going to be cut out and inserted into the host cell genome um, as a CRISPR spacer right here. So here in red, you have the one from this specific virus. Uh, in yellow, green, and blue, you would have different segments that are from um, different viruses that infected the cell in the past. Um, each one has been converted into a CRISPR spacer inside the chromosome of the host cell. Um, and those are going to be transcribed to make CRISPR RNA or CR RNA. Um, this RNA is containing a little stem where it attaches to proteins, and then it contains the segment that's from that original viral uh, genome. So this segment is going to be used to identify the virus in the future. Um, each of these uh, CRRNAs can associate with Cas proteins to form these little uh, CRISPR-Cas complexes. And these complexes were, are what would actually destroy the DNA of incoming viruses to defeat new infections. So now if, a, if another virus comes to infect the cell that is like a virus that infected the cell in the past, in this case it's green, um, and in the past a different green virus infected the cell. So here we have a CRRNA that's made with that uh, genetic sequence and associated with the Cas protein. So now this little tag of the CRRNA that is from that genetic sequence is going to match up with it and base pair with it um, and let, lets you identify the viral DNA. And then the Cas protein is just going to cut the viral DNA and chop it into little pieces. Um, once the viral DNA is all chopped up, then it's not I guess, dangerous anymore. Um, of course, in order for CRISPR to work, the cell kind of has to survive viral infections by other, you know, means. Um, but actually, if it does survive the infection and it gets the CRISPR segment from that virus's DNA to protect it from the same virus in the future, it would actually be able to pass that on. Since that's just a part of the chromosome now of the virus, uh, sorry, of the host cell, it's going to pass it on to all the daughter cells that descend from that host cell. So you're not only getting the ones from uh, viruses that you yourself encountered and you know survived, um, but also all of your ancestor cells. You would inherit their CRISPR segments as well. Um, so you're kind of building a library of immunity to different viruses. Uh, prokaryotes will also use restriction enzymes to protect themselves from viruses. Uh, restriction enzymes, you have a lot of a lot of different ones actually. Each each one recognizes a specific sec, uh, sequence of DNA, um, like just a specific short sequence of nucleotides, like maybe G A T T C or something like that. Um, and it'll just scan um, the genetic material in the cell, um, particularly looking at viral uh, genetic material, uh, just looking for that sequence of nucleotides that it recognizes everywhere that it finds it is going to make a cut. Um, in order to protect the host cell genetic material from the restriction enzymes, the host cell will do something to it, uh, like modifying it somehow. Most prokaryotes will methylate their, uh, their chromosomes, so they will just add little methyl groups to the DNA. 
and that tells the host cell that this is my DNA and it prevents the restriction enzymes from cutting it. So viral DNA, if it doesn't have the methyl groups added to it, it's going to get cut up by those restriction enzymes and that protects the host cell. Um, a way for a virus to get around that might be to have an enzyme that adds methyl groups to its DNA. Um, and at that point, it would look like host cell DNA and the restriction enzymes would not interact with it. Um, so both the CRISPR-Cas uh, system and the restriction enzymes are really useful tools in, in labs. Um, and they're just used like, well, restriction enzymes have been used basically all the time for many years. Uh, CRISPR is more of a new technology, but it's becoming very common in, in labs as well. Uh, both of them used because they're able to cut DNA at specific places so that you know and can control where the DNA is being cut. Um, for eukaryotes, they'll have uh, enzymes called exonucleases, um, which just chew up uh, DNA or RNA. Actually, for eukaryotes, most of them will chew up RNA, so there'll be RNA exonucleases, um, and they chew it from the ends. The exo means from the ends. So the nuclease part means that it destroys nucleic acid, and the exo part means that it destroys it from the ends of a strand. Um, and this is the type of enzyme that is going to be degrading the mRNA um, or any RNA that's found kind of loose in, in a eukaryotic cell. The host cell mRNA is going to have the poly A tail on it, and that protects it from degradation by the exonucleases. Um, if you have viral RNA in there, it doesn't have the poly A tail, the exonucleases are going to chew it up. But of course, again, viral uh, viruses could protect themselves from that or kind of get around that defense um, if they're able to get a poly A tail of their own. So actually, a lot of viruses that infect eukaryotic cells will, will do that. They'll have some way of making or stealing their own poly A tail for their mRNA so it doesn't get destroyed. So that's the lytic life cycle um, and some of the uh, ways that the host cell defends itself from viruses uh, <laughs> infecting the cell in that way. Um, now we have the lysogenic life cycle, the, the um, less common type of life cycle that's also less dangerous for host cells uh, in general. Um, so a lot of the steps in the lysogenic cycle are the same as from the lytic cycle, and it's going to start with um, the first two steps from the lytic cycle attachment and penetration. So first the virus has to attach to a host cell using the surface proteins it has that are going to bind a receptor somewhere on the host cell. Then it has to do penetration, um, either being taken up into the host cell and uncoating and losing its capsid or um, injecting its genome and any enzymes that it has into the host cell. Um, then the next step in the lytic cycle would be synthesis, but in the lysogenic cycle, instead of going to synthesis, you go to lysogenic integration. Um, in lysogenic integration, you have the genome of the virus entering the host cell and basically going dormant um, and just, you know, staying inactive. Um, sometimes the the viral genome might actually be inserted into the chromosome of the host cell, or sometimes it might not be, and it might just be kind of floating in the cytoplasm of the host cell, kind of in an inactive form. Um, if the virus is actually inserting its genome into the host cell chromosome, then you call that inserted genome a provirus or a prophage. Um, if it's, if it's a bacteriophage virus and this is a bacterial host cell, then you would call it a prophage. Um, and, you know, just any virus that is integrated into the host chromosome would be a provirus. Um, so the, the terms provirus and prophage actually are not referring to like the whole virus with the, you know, like a particle with a capsid. They're actually just referring to the genome, the genome that has been inserted into the chromosome of the host cell. Um, so it's just a bit of genetic material. You call it a provirus or a prophage because it can be used to make more viral genomes. Those can be used to make viral proteins, and then those would assemble into viral particles. So if you have that uh, provirus or prophage genome in your chromosome, um, basically any time that it activates, you can have new viruses being made uh, inside that cell. 
Um, if the viral genome is not inserted into the host chromosome, but is just remaining dormant, kind of floating around in the cytoplasm, then we would call that an episome. Um, episome can also mean other things actually outside of um, virology, but in virology it would mean um, the genome of a lysogenic virus that is just latent and dormant inside the cell, not part of the host chromosome. Um, once that host cell has the lysogenic virus integrated with it, we call it a lysogen. It's kind of acting normal, looking normal, but secretly it has a latent virus inside of it, which means that at any point, if that virus activates, it can start building new virus particles, it can release those viral particles, and you would have just virus on the loose. Um, so it's lysogen because it can give rise to viruses. Um, here you have kind of a summary of the lytic versus lysogenic pathways. So in each pathway, we start out with um, attachment, then we go to penetration. Um, in this case, this is a bacterial host, so the virus has injected its genome into, which would be the, like the little dark green segment, has injected its genome into the uh, host cell. If we were going to the lytic pathway, next we would go to synthesis, where you would make uh, viral proteins and new copies of the genome. Um, in the lysogenic pathway, instead we go to integration, in which the viral chromosome um, will be integrated with the host cell and remain dormant, either attached to the chromosome or not. Um, here is shown kind of in the process of attaching, and here it's actually integrated into the host cell chromosome as a proper prophage. So now, any time that this cell divides, if this virus doesn't activate for a long time, the cell might just divide, and now all of the daughter cells are going to have that virus as well. They have the prophage in them. They are all lysogens, um, and they can all, you know, be activated and start making new viral particles at any time. Um, after lysogenic integration, you have lysogenic maintenance which lasts kind of an indeterminate amount of time, could be very short, could be very long. Um, during lysogenic maintenance, basically just the genome of that virus is dormant and it just stays dormant. Um, so just the amount of time that that genome stays dormant is the lysogenic maintenance phase. Um, different viruses will have different ways of keeping their genome dormant. Um, for a lot of viruses, you would have actually like one gene in that viral genome that actually is not dormant. Dormant, It is active and it's being transcribed and translated um, to make you know, viral proteins, um, which would specifically be repressor proteins that then attach to the genome, to that viral genome, and make sure that it stays dormant, so preventing transcription with the genome. Um, then as long as you have those repressor proteins attached to the viral genome, it's going to stay dormant and you can't activate it. Um, and again, during this period, which can last, you know, who knows how long, could last a very long time, potentially, if that cell divides, um, the provirus or the prophage is going to be passed on to all, um, all the daughter cells. Then if those daughter cells div divide and you're still in the lysogenic maintenance stage, then the, the new daughter cells are gonna get the provirus as well, um, so on and so forth. If we're talking about an animal host, like a human host, um, if the host cell is part of the germline, so it's part of, you know, it's a cell that's gonna either make an egg cell or a sperm, um, then you can actually end up with eggs or sperm that have the provirus inside of them in the lysogenic maintenance phase. Um, and then, you know, the child, um, I guess if that egg or sperm would be fertilized and, you know, become a child, that child would have the virus uh, as a provirus in each of their, in each of their cells. Um, that's extremely unlikely. It's very, very uncommon, but it can happen and it has happened in the past. And that is the reason why so much of our genome is actually coming from viruses. About 8% is from viruses ultimately. At some point, the lysogenic maintenance phase is gonna come to an end and the virus is gonna go to the induction phase. In the induction phase, the genome is gonna reactivate 
and the virus is going to re-enter the lytic cycle. Um, so just the actual reactivation of the of the viral genome is what happens in induction. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why induction could occur, and we don't really understand everything about like why it happens or what triggers it to happen or how it happens. Um, but we do know that if the repressor protein um, goes away for some reason, like if its transcription or translation is damaged for some reason, then you're not going to have um, the viral genome remaining dormant and it's going to activate. Also, it seems that a lot of the time if the host cell becomes stressed, like if it's exposed to UV radiation, um, that will activate the induction phase as well a lot of the time. Um, <clears throat> As far as how the induction phase is occurring exactly, it's different for different viruses, and we don't know that much about it. But we do know that it requires um, an interaction between proteins that are from the virus and proteins from, that are from the host. Um, in the induction phase, if you had a provirus or a prophage, it's going to get cut out of the host chromosome. Um, when that happens, it's possible that you might accidentally cut out some of the host genes as well, or some host genetic material as well. Um, then that is going to end up being replicated um, as the genome of the virus, as though it were part of the genome of the virus, and it's going to get put into new viral particles later on in later stages of the life cycle. Um, and you know, those new viral particles or those new variants will all end up with this little bit of the host cell DNA. Um, and then they're going to take that to the next host cell and inject it um, into the next host cell. So that's also a form of horizontal gene transfer that's caused by viruses, or that's kind of another opportunity for viruses to transfer DNA horizontally between their hosts. Um, so after induction, then you go to the synthesis phase um, in the lytic cycle. So you're making new copies of the viral genome, making viral proteins, then the assembly phase in which you're assembling the new viral particles and the release phase in which those particles are released, usually destroying the cell unless it's a persistent infection. And so this diagram is just showing that here you would have the lysogenic maintenance um, where the genome is remaining dormant, it's being passed on to daughter cells. Then in this particular cell, something happens to make it enter the induction phase. So maybe this cell was exposed to some stress and then the provirus inside of it um, went into induction and then you entered the lytic cycle again. So synthesis, making new copies of the viral genome, making new viral proteins, assembly, assembling those new viral particles and release in which the host cell bursts and the new viral particles or virions now come out. Um, so here you have diagrams comparing the lytic and lysogenic life cycles. Here is the lytic cycle on the um, left side. Um, and step one, attachment. The virus is going to attach to the host cell. Um, the virus has to have surface proteins that can bind receptors on the host cell. The host cell has to have the right receptor. Um, then you have penetration in which the virus um, either enters the host cell or injects its DNA. In this case, the virus is actually being taken up into the host cell. So that means that this is most likely an animal cell, and this would be an animal virus. Um, then in this diagram, uncoding is counted as its own phase, even though we're not going to be specifically counting it as its own phase. But after the virus enters the host cell, it does have to get rid of its capsid and release its genome into the host cell. Then you have the synthesis stage in which the genome um, is copied a lot of times and you're manufacturing new viral particles. Then you have the assembly phase in which um, those proteins start assembling into capsids and then uh, the genome is pumped inside of each capsid. Then finally the release stage in which the new viral particles are released from the host cell. Um, up here on the right, you have the lysogenic cycle. It starts the same as the lytic cycle with attachment. Uh, this is actually a bacteriophage, which means that this cell must be a bacterial cell. Um, 
actually in this diagram it's not showing attachment separate from penetration I'm sorry about that you guys um, <laughs> that's my cat um, so actually first you would have attachment where just the host cell attaches uh, sorry the virus just attaches to the host cell and then you would have penetration where the virus actually injects its genome which is being shown here um, once you've gone through penetration then you have lysogenic integration um, <clears throat> in this case the viral genome has inserted itself into the host chromosome so that this is now a prophage but it could also have been separate from the chromosome as an episome um, and it's going to remain dormant there. So then you have lysogenic maintenance where the cell continues to live and to divide. The genome remains dormant and all the daughter cells have that dormant prophage genome. Um, then you have induction. Something happens to trigger the activation of the viral genome. Um, since it was a prophage, now it's going to get cut out of the host chromosome and become an independent genome again. Um, and the virus will now enter or re-enter the lytic cycle. So now you have synthesis, building new copies of that genome and building viral proteins. Then you have assembly where the capsid is a symbol and each capsid is pumped full of the genome. And then you have release where the, all the new viral particles are released from the host cell and the host cell probably um, bursts. Then finally at the very bottom here, it shows the steps of um, an animal virus emerging during the release step um, and taking an envelope with it. So this is going to be an enveloped virus when it's inside of the host cell still. It does not have the envelope, uh, but you do have these little patches of the host cell membrane where viral proteins have already inserted themselves into the host cell membrane. And then it's not shown, but what else you would have here are just the regular host cell proteins that are all over the entire host cell membrane. So this viral particle is going to approach uh, this patch of the membrane and push out into it. Um, and the membrane is basically going to wrap around it and detach from the host cell. And now it is an envelope for this new virion. It carries viral proteins on it, and it also carries host cell proteins that are going to help hide this virus from the host cell immune system. And the last thing we'll talk about are the retroviruses, which are those really weird viruses that we kind of mentioned at the beginning of the uh, chap or presentation um, that have a weird way or a unique way of, um, I guess, working with their genome and getting it you know, to be used to make protein. Uh, so retroviruses are all plus sense single-stranded RNA viruses uh, with envelopes that infect animals. Um, and they also all use reverse transcription. Um, so reverse transcription is just the opposite of transcription. In transcription, you're using DNA as a template to make RNA. In reverse transcription, you're using RNA as a template to make DNA. So that's a unique process. No cellular life form can do reverse transcription. They don't have the right enzyme. Only retroviruses and DNA retroviruses have the reverse transcriptase enzyme that you need to do reverse transcription. Um, so since those viruses have been discovered, we've isolated that enzyme and are now able to kind of mass produce it. Um, and it's very widely used in labs because it is the only way to make um, DNA from an RNA template. So retroviruses uh, will all, um, you know, once they've gotten their genome loose inside the cell, they will all use the reverse transcriptase, uh, reverse transcriptase enzyme to um, make a DNA copy of their RNA genome. Um, so they start out actually with a single-stranded RNA genome, and they're going to make a double-stranded DNA genome ultimately off of that. That's a copy of that RNA genome. Once they have that double-stranded DNA copy made, they're going to insert it into the host chromosome using the enzyme integrase, which just um, opens up a piece of DNA and inserts new DNA uh, in there and just closes up you know, the ends. So that's also become very useful in the lab. Anytime you need to insert DNA um, into a larger molecule of DNA, you would use the integrase enzyme to do it, or you could use the integrase enzyme to do it. Um, 
once the uh, genome has been integrated into the host chromosome, now that's called a provirus. Um, so it's basically going to follow the lysogenic life cycle at that point um, and, you know, remain latent or dormant in the host cell uh, chromosome for um, an indeterminate amount of time, maybe just a short time, but potentially a very long time, could be years. Um, what's different about the retrovirus, I guess, is that after you have lysogenic induction or, you know, induction where the genome re, uh, reactivates um, normally, if you had a provirus, that provirus would be cut out of the host chromosome in the induction phase. For with retroviruses, um, it's not cut out. The provirus will actually remain inside the host chromosome, and it'll just be used from there to make new copies of the viral genome um, and to make you know viral mRNA for making viral proteins. Uh, then those new genome copies and the new viral proteins will assemble um, and be released. Um, so the most prominent example of a retrovirus is actually HIV. There's a number of retroviruses that infect people, but HIV is by far kind of the most serious one. Um, and of course that causes AIDS. So I guess once you're infected with HIV, you don't get AIDS right away. And that's partly because the HIV virus is going to integrate into the chromosome of your cells and remain dormant there for an unknown amount of time. And that's why um, sometimes you can go for years um, after being HIV positive, but before you actually get AIDS. It just kind of depends. Um, it depends on when that, uh, when those dormant proviruses activate when they enter induction. Um, so here's kind of a diagram of the basic life cycle of a retrovirus where, you know, it attaches to a host cell and then you have penetration. So it's going to be taken up inside the host cell since it's an animal virus, it's probably taken up. Then it'll uncoat and you have its single-stranded RNA genome. Um, then you're going to have reverse transcription by reverse transcriptase to create a double-stranded DNA copy of that genome. That is then going to enter the nucleus where it's going to integrate with the host cell chromosome um, using the enzyme integrase. And so at this point, it's a provirus in the, um, well, I guess this would be the lysogenic integration phase, and then it'll enter the lysogenic maintenance phase for an untold amount of time um, where it just remains there dormant in the host cell chromosome. Then you have um, the synthesis phase where you're creating new, um, in this case, this is new single-stranded RNA to be used as a viral mRNA to build viral proteins. So you're going to be building viral proteins, then um, then copying this genome again into single-stranded RNA format. So I guess when you make viral mRNA, that's also the same format as the original viral genome. Um, then that's all going to assemble into new viral particles that are then released. And as they go, they take a section of the host cell membrane to become the envelope. 